family, we want to welcome all of you here. Uh, my name is Frances Orton, and I serve as the chair for the Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Max Smith Family Association. And I am so honored to serve with some pretty amazing people on our committee. And one of our goals is to celebrate the commemorative events of our family and share that history to re and reverence the legacy of our family, recognize the divine intervention, enlighten the world, and train our youth. And when I pass from this life, I... I hope that when I meet Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy and all the Smith family, that I'll be prepared and know them. And tonight, I am wearing my Smith family lilac necklace that was made by some of our committee members, Debbie Nelson and their, her daughter, Courtney. And the Smith family lilacs um, have been in Kirtland and Nauvoo and in Salt Lake and it's been a fun little thing that we've had at some of our um, gatherings. And tonight, each of you should have received one of these Moroni pins. So I, I hope you make sure before you leave that you pick one of those up. They have been donated for those who are in attendance here tonight. I also want you to know that we're broadcasting this from Palmyra, New York, which is real close to our, our Smith family property. Um, I would like to draw your attention to several people we need to thank. On the back of our program, we have the names of all those who are in the Erie Corral sitting behind me, um, and all those who've helped us with the building. Uh, tonight, I'd also like to thank our music director, Claire Nebrowski, and our pianist, Charlene Campbell. And I will um, have a start with the opening song, which is hymn 66, Rejoice the Lord is King, after which our invocation will be given by Julie Maddox. And um, after Julie, we are going to announce our Smith Family Scholarships. <laughs> Father in heaven, we are so grateful 
to come before thee this beautiful evening, to meet together as thy children, and to commemorate and celebrate the great love that thou hast bestowed on us, and to thank thee so much for the many blessings we have. We celebrate the beauty of righteousness coming from heaven, from the heavens dropping down and announcing thy great love and thy son, Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected. We are so grateful for truth coming out of the earth, for the many blessings that we have, that we know of our Savior's love, that we can have this love and this thy spirit to be with us, we pray that we might open our hearts and our minds, that we might be united in spirit, that we might be able to thank thee and praise thee for the many blessings that are ours. And we pray for those who are struggling and suffering, that they might feel of thy love and be buoyed up and strengthened by the grace of our Savior and the great love and revelations. We are so grateful for the restored gospel, for the Book of Mormon, for a living prophet, for the blessings that are, attend us because of temples on earth. We ask thee to be with us this night. We pray that the technology would work, that we might be strengthened in heart and mind. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. My name is Steve Orton, and I am excited to announce the winners of the Joseph Smith and Lucy Max Smith 2023 scholarship winners. Our third place prize goes to Jeanette Baird. And one change we made on this year is that we are presenting this from Palmyra, and she is in Spokane, Washington. So instead of must be present to win, we've changed it to must be pleasant to win. <laughs> so as you can see, she serves and makes senior citizens pleasant through her music. She wins $250. Second place goes to David Pinniger Jr. He is from Chesterfield, New Hampshire, but he's in Buenos Aires on a mission right now. And he did a musical arrangement, uh, The Miraculous Power of God. He wins $500. Our $1,000 first place winner is Chloe Cricket Isom. And with a name like Cricket, she is also pleasant from Cedar City, Utah, and actually just at, started Brigham Young University, and she did a slam poem called Related. We're grateful for all those who participated in the 2023 scholarship event. After all of the struggles, persecutions, problems that the Smiths faced, not one of them ever recounted or denied their testimony. Their testimonies began in this very area, and tonight we're going to review some of those. We will go in the following order. Joseph Smith Sr. will be by Don Blanchard, Lucy Max Smith, Suzanne Jones, Alvin Smith by Josh Orton, Hiram Smith by Richard Nelson, Joseph Smith Jr. by Dave Robison, Emma Smith by Lee Constantino, Samuel Smith, Charles Olson, Don Carlos, Doug Blanchard, Catherine Smith, Stephanie Schwantes, William Smith, Troy Tanner, Sophronia and Lucy, Carol Quinn, Joseph and Hiram's dying testimony will be by Matthew Maddox and will go to that point. Father Smith was the first one to hear of Moroni's visit to his son, Joseph Jr. He was also the first one to believe in Joseph's vision of, of Moroni. After being told that Moroni instructed young Joseph to meet him at the Hill Cumorah, Joseph Sr. immediately 
told his son to accept it and that it was of God and to go and do as, the, as, as commanded by the messenger. Father Smith walked thousands of miles bearing testimony of these events. His most prominent testimony is printed for the world to read in the front of each copy of the Book of Mormon as one of the eight witnesses. Joseph Smith Sr. boldly affixed his name, testifying that he had seen and hefted the gold plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated. On one occasion, he was imprisoned and told he would be released if he would deny the divinity of the Book of Mormon. Not only did he not deny it, but he converted two persons during his 30-day confinement. In 1831, in a church conference, he stood with three of his sons and swore to the divinity of the Book of Mormon by raising his right hand. Throughout his life, Father Smith proved true to his calling and bearing witness and testimony of Moroni and of the Book of Mormon. At his funeral, it was acknowledged that he was chosen by the Almighty to be one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon, and that from that time, his only aim was the promotion of truth. He was recognized as being a man faithful to his God and to the church in every circumstance and all and situation. Lucy Mack Smith was fierce in her testimony and unrelenting in support of Joseph, her prophet son. It seems that she constantly and consistently bore a fiery testimony of the Book of Mormon. She once said that people often asked her about the details of its coming forth, and as a result, quote, she had almost destroyed my lungs giving these recitals to those who felt anxious to hear. Mother Smith's testimony is powerfully evidenced on her journey from New York to Kirtland on the Erie Canal. A heckler on the shore shouted to her and those on the boat, is the Book of Mormon true? That book, replied I, was brought forth by the power of God and translated by the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if I could make my voice sound as loud as the trumpet of Michael the Archangel, I would declare the truth of the same from land to land and from sea to sea, for I do testify that God has revealed himself to man again in these last days. On another occasion, she and Joseph Smith Sr. could have received forgiveness of a debt if they would just burn their copies of the Book of Mormon. She responded to the offer with these words. Now here, sir, because God has raised up my son to bring forth a book which was written for the salvation of the souls of men, for the salvation of your soul as well as mine, and you think by this that you will compel us to deny the work of God and destroy a book which was translated by the gift and power of the Holy Ghost? But, sir, we shall not burn the Book of Mormon, nor deny the inspiration of the Almighty. One more account confirms her consistency of testimony and fierce disposition. When confronted in Palmyra by a former minister and some parishioners, she told the group boldly, if you should stick my flesh full of faggots and even burn me at the stake, I would declare that Joseph have got the record and that I know it to be true. Alvin, 
the oldest son manifest his testimony of the reality of Moroni's first four visits to the Smith Log Home on his deathbed. Alvin died in 1823 at age 25. This was barely two months following Moroni's first visit and four years before Joseph received the golden plates. Alvin fully believed in Joseph's mission and admonished Joseph with these words, do everything that lies in your power to obtain the record. Be faithful in receiving instructions and in keeping every commandment that is given you. Hiram Smith's certain and unwavering testimony is documented as early as 1830 when he, along with his father and brother Samuel, were allowed to view the gold plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated. As one of the eight witnesses, he testified for the rest of his life to the divinity of the Book of Mormon. His witness continues even to this day through the written testimony in each Book of Mormon. His witness continues, and he testified that he had seen the plates with his eyes and handled them with his hands. Hiram's testimony is strengthened by his seemingly constant persecution, abuse, and even imprisonment. An example is his long imprisonment in the Liberty Jail, after which he declared, quote, I was innocent of crime. I had been dragged from my family. I had been abused and thrust into a dungeon and confined for months on account of my faith and the testimony of Jesus Christ. However, I thank God that I felt the determination to die rather than deny the things which my eyes had seen, which my hands had handled, and which I had borne testimony to. I can assure my beloved brethren that I was enabled to bear as strong a testimony when nothing but death presented itself as ever I did in my life." Close quote. In the end, Hiram paid the ultimate price as he gave his life with his younger brother, Joseph, in Carthage as his final testimony. Joseph Smith's whole life was spent in testifying in his, to his God-given experiences and mission. In the preface to the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith declared his simple, short, and perhaps most powerful testimony. I would inform you that I translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. On several other occasions, he repeated that it had been done by the gift and power of God. Joseph Smith was so determined to establish the Book of Mormon as the center of the restored gospel that he said, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. In perhaps his most impressive public display of testimony, Joseph stood side by side with his father and brothers, Hiram and Samuel, at the October 1831 General Conference. With an uplifted right hand, he formally swore his solemn testimony to the truth of the Book of Mormon before the congregation. At the end of his life, Joseph paid the ultimate price as he was martyred at the hands of a mob in Carthage, Illinois. However, before the assassin's bullet took his life, he brazenly turned to the guards who held him captive and bore a powerful testimony of the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon. He closed his life with his testimony and literally sealed his mission and his works with his own blood.
Late in life, Emma told her oldest son, Joseph III, my belief is that the Book of Mormon is of divine authenticity. I have not the slightest doubt of it. I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writings of the manuscripts unless he was inspired. For when acting as his scribe, your father would dictate to me hour after hour. And when returning after meals or after interruptions, he could at once begin where he had left off without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. This was a usual thing for him to do. It would have been improbable for a learned man that could do this. And for one so ignorant and unlearned as he was, it was simply impossible. She further elaborated, the plates often lay on a table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth, which I had given him to fold them in. I once felt of the plates as they thus lay on the table. Tracing their outline and shape, they seemed to be pliable, like thick paper, and would rustle with a metallic sound when the edges were moved by the thumb, as one would rustle the edges, the, the edges of a book. When questioned if Joseph Smith could have dictated the Book of Mormon after having first written it, or having first read it out of some book, Emma responded, Joseph Smith could neither write nor dictate in a well-worded letter, let alone dictate a book like the Book of Mormon. And though I was an active participant in the scenes that transpired and was present during the translation of the plates and had cognizance of things as they transpired, it is marvelous to me, a marvel and a wonder, as much so as to anyone else. Samuel developed his testimony early in Harmony, Pennsylvania, where he lived with Joseph and Emma while Joseph was engaged in translating the Book of Mormon. Upon encouragement by Joseph, Samuel retired to the woods and by secret and fervent prayer, prayer obtained revelation for himself sufficient to convince him of the truth. At age 22, he became one of the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon and signed this formal statement with his father and brother Hiram. Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people unto whom the, this work shall come, that Joseph Smith, Jr., the translator of the Book of Mormon, has shown unto us the plates which have the appearance of gold we did handle with our hands, and we also saw the engravings thereon, all of which have the appearance of ancient work and of curious workmanship. And this we bear record with words of soberness, for we have seen and hefted and know of a surety that Joseph Smith has gotten the plates of which he has spoken, and we give our names unto the world to witness unto the world that which we have seen, and we lie not, God bearing witness of it. He was the first missionary formally set apart by the prophet Joseph Smith. Samuel forever endeared himself to the John Young family, including sons Brigham and Phineas, as he gave Phineas the Young's first copy of the Book of Mormon. As Samuel presented it, he bore his witness. I know this book to be a revelation from God, translated by the gift and power of the Holy Ghost, and that my brother, Joseph Smith, Jr., is a prophet, seer, and revelator. Don Carlos Smith was the youngest of the Smith sons. At Don Carlos's death, the prophet Joseph Smith paid tribute to his younger brother's long-held witness as he stated that Don Carlos was one of the first to receive my testimony. The evening after the Book of Mormon plates were shown to the eight witnesses, 
Joseph Smith said that all the witnesses, as also Don Carlos, bore testimony to the truth of the Latter-day Dispensation. The spirit of testimony marked, this spirit of testimony marked Don Carlos's entire life. In 1830, when but 14, he accompanied his father on a mission to St. Lawrence County, New York, by testifying and providing cop copy the, them books of Mormon. They were instrumental in the conversion of his cousin and future church leader, George A. Smith. When the Smith family arrived in Kirtland in February of 1831, Don Carlos was so exhausted from his journey and fell asleep in his chair during the first Sunday meeting they attended. Nonetheless, said James Henry Rollins, after several had spoken, Don Carlos awoke and arose and bore as strong a testimony as I ever heard of the truth of the work. This spirit of testimony of the Book of Mormon guided him throughout his missions in Pennsylvania, New York, Virginia, and Ohio. He later went on missions to Tennessee and to Kentucky to raise money to buy out the claims and property of the mobbers in Davis County, Missouri. His own journal tells of the experiences in which he testified to mobs and mobbers who were violently unfriendly to Latter-day Saint causes. Don Carlos also was one of the few who Joseph selected to bear testimony at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Joseph simply recorded that President Don Carlos Smith also bore testimony of the truth of the work of the Lord in which we were engaged. Catherine Smith Salisbury was the last surviving child of Joseph Smith, Joseph Sr. and Lucy Max Smith. It is said that Catherine was frequently sought out by converts, missionaries, and reporters for her recollections of Moroni's visit, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and the latter, latter day restoration. It is also said that she was quick to share her testimony of the truth of the work the family helped to establish. She gave one of her most powerful testimonies to an admiring church conference just five years before her death. She declared, I desire before I pass away to place my testimony on record. I am the only surviving sister of the martyrs Joseph and Hiram Smith and will soon be 73 years old. I can testify to the fact of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and also to its truth. I well remember the trials my brother had. He went frequently to the hill, and upon returning would tell us, I have seen the records, also the brass plates and the sword of Laban with the breastplate and interpreters. I shall soon pass away, but while I can, I will bear my testimony to the truth of the Latter-day work, both spiritual and temporal. I know that it is true. Catherine, apparently, like others in the family, also hefted the concealed plates. She once told her grandson, Herbert S. Salisbury, who was a college president and church historian, that while dusting out the room where the prophets had his study, she saw a package on the table containing the gold plates, on which was engraved the story of the Book of Mormon. She said she hefted those plates and found them to be heavy, like gold and also rippled, rippled her fingers up the edge of the plates and felt that they were separate metal plates and heard the tinkle of the sound that they made. William always defended his brother Joseph and bore witness that he was a prophet. William electrified an audience in 1844 as he delivered these irrefutable words of testimony. He said, I hold in my hand the Book of Mormon. The world has been filled with articles for the purpose of making it appear a falsehood. One of the great hobbies raised upon which to fight is the angel's visit to Joseph Smith. I well remember the effect produced upon my father's family when he told us he was to receive the plates. How we looked forward with joy 
and waited until the time should come. When Joseph received them, he came in and said, Father, I have got the plates. All believed it was true, father, mother, brothers, and sisters. You can tell what a child is. Parents know whether their children are truthful or not. Father knew his child was telling the truth. When the plates were brought in, they were wrapped in a tow frock. My father then put them into a pillowcase. We handled the plates and could tell what they were. As near as I could tell, they weighed about 60 pounds. Being a mixture of gold and copper, they were much heavier than stone and very much heavier than wood. I expect to stand before angels and archangels and be judged for how I have told it. Joseph's remaining two sisters, Sophronia, born in 1803, and Lucy, born in 1821, also believed in Joseph. Although documented testimonies from them is scarce, it is known that they had strong testimonies and bore them publicly. William, their brother, said, all believed it was true, father, mother, brothers, and sisters. One reason they believed was because Father and Mother Smith gathered their family together in the evenings to learn of Joseph's experiences and scenes he had witnessed while translating. Sophronia and Lucy, along with the others, learned and developed testimonies, while as Mother Smith stated, Joseph commenced telling us the great and glorious things which God had manifested to him. Joseph related scenes in great detail for example, he would describe the ancient inhabitants of this continent, their dress, their mode of traveling, and the animals upon which they rode, their cities and their buildings, with every particular. He would describe their mode of warfare, as also their religious worship. This he would do with as much ease, seemingly, as if he had spent his whole life with them. Sophronia's testimony was also strengthened by one experience in Palmyra when Joseph handed their sister Catherine the wrapped plates to hide from a pursuing mob. Catherine ran to the bedroom where she and Sophronia slept. Sophronia threw back the bedding and Catherine put the bundle on the bed, quickly replacing the bedding. Both of them lay down on the bed and pretended to sleep, thus outwitting the mob. A few references to testimony from Sophronia and Lucy have survived. An elder from the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, George F. A. Spiller, visited Sophronia and her two sisters, Catherine and Lucy. He recorded, they testified that they knew that their brother Joseph was a prophet of God. Sophronia died in 1876. Her obituary noted, that she was ever ready to bear her testimony to the truth of the work. These are Elder Holland's words, which he requested be recorded as his testimony in heaven and on earth. When Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram started for Carthage to face what they knew would be an imminent martyrdom, Hiram read these words to comfort the heart of his brother. Thou hast been faithful, wherefore thou shalt be made strong, even unto the sitting down in the place which I have prepared in the mansions of my father. And now I, Moroni, bid farewell until we shall meet before the judgment seat of Christ. A few short verses from the 12th chapter of Ether in the Book of Mormon. Before closing the book, Hiram turned down the corner of the page from which he had read, marking it as part of the everlasting testimony for which these two brothers were about to die. Elder Holland then held in his hand that book the very copy from which Hiram read 
the same corner of the page turned down, still visible. Shortly thereafter, Pistol and Ball would take the lives of these two testators. I submit this as yet one more evidence of its truthfulness. In this, their greatest and last hour of need, I ask you, would these men blaspheme before God by continuing to fix their lives, their honor, and their own search for eternal salvation on a book, and by implication, a church and a ministry, that they had fictitiously created out of whole cloth? Never mind that their wives are about to be widowed and their children fatherless. Never mind that their little band of followers will yet be houseless, friendless, and homeless, and that their children will leave footprints of blood across frozen rivers in an untamed prairie floor. Never mind that legions will die, and other legions live, declaring in the four quarters of this earth that they know the Book of Mormon and the church which espouses it to be true. Disregard all of that and tell me whether in this hour of death these two men would enter the presence of their eternal judge, quoting from and finding solace in a book which, if not the very word of God, would, would brand them as impostors and charlatans until the end of time. They would not do this. They were willing to die rather than deny the divine origin and the eternal truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. We will now have a musical number from the Erie Choral. After the choir, we will have our speaker, um, Daniel Adams. And Daniel has served with the Joe Smith Sr. and Lucy Max Smith uh, Family Association over the past decade as a spokesperson, the producer of the Smith Family podcasts and vlogs that detail the Smith family's amazing heritage um, journeyings across the United States. He's co-founder and science officer of a medical device company specializing in Parkinson's disease. And we're grateful that he is here to speak to us today. And after Daniel speaks, uh, the congregational number is the morning breaks, after which our benediction will be by Daniel C. Patrick.
That was amazingly beautiful, and it uh, has set a beautiful tone. And I pray that the Spirit can be with me as we talk about the incredible visit of Moroni to Joseph Smith and Moroni's role. Um, and I pray that you may be edified as well as I um, in this attempt. Um, I sort of feel a weight of this um, opportunity to speak to you, and, and I've practiced so, several different versions of this, this talk with my family, and I kept thinking, oh, it's getting better, that's a great talk, and then I remembered this um, quote from Elder Glenn Rudd when he spoke to BYU once. He said, um, a general authority spoke at a large meeting, and he gave a great talk, and he sat down, and he turned to his wife, and he said, how many truly great people are there in the world? And she said, I'm not sure, but I know it's one less than you think. <laughs> and so <laughs> with that in mind, I just uh, I pray, for, uh, pray for the Spirit and for your help. And I'd like to acknowledge, too, I have a son who has an incredible mind. And uh, in talking this over with him has given me uh, a great deal of uh, insight into the role of Moroni and what's going on. Um, and I want to talk about Moroni, but you really can't get into Moroni without talking about the importance of the Book of Mormon and the great record that the Book of Mormon is. And that record, let me see if I can bring this up here. Um, that record can't be possible without the great restore prophets that caused it to be able to come forth. And as part of that, and understanding what Moroni's role was and who he was, when we get through with that, we really have to ask ourselves, what is our obligation? We are descendants of those great people. And we do have an obligation to them for what has happened. And so if I start this out, I love the prayer that Sister Maddox prayed because we really are talking about righteousness out of heaven and truth out of the earth. Enoch is seeing the history of the earth unfold before him, and he sees all these terrible things. He sees apostasies happen. He sees the children of men be righteous, and then they turn wicked again. And he's just weeping, and he says to the Lord, when will the earth rest? When is, are we going to be able to just rejoice and be together? And the Father says to him, there is going to come a time. And let me just read this to you. And the day shall come that the earth shall rest, but before that day, the heavens shall be darkened, and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake and also the earth, and great tribulation shall be among the children of men, but my people will I preserve. And righteousness I will send down out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth to bear testimony of my only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, yea, and also the resurrection of all men, and the righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood to gather out mine elect from the four quarters of the earth into a place which I shall prepare in holy city, that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming. For there shall be my tabernacle, and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then, then shalt thou and thy city meet them there, and we will receive them unto our bosom, and they shall see us. And we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we shall kiss each other. Isn't that our desire? When will the earth rest? When can we be reunited with our loving ancestors, those who we honor tonight? And um, when will righteousness sweep the earth? 
This is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith goes into a grove, and righteousness comes down out of heaven, and then Moroni comes to Joseph Smith, and truth comes out of the earth. I want to talk about this record because there's a great doctrine associated with that record. And it's very important to understand that if we desire salvation, it's imperative for us to know how the Lord gathers his people because we need to know what he tells them and what the covenants are so that we can keep those covenants. And so the Lord then creates this record. And it's a witness of his dealings that have been kept from the beginning that both prophesies and testifies of this gathering. And he commands um, his people to record those prophecies in history that they may be judged accordingly at the last day. So that's how great and important this record is. And this is what Moses 6, that's where I was reading, comes from. That's why it's so important, because he's talking about the record. And Enoch speaks then about how the Lord starts the record. And it says, and a book of remembrance was kept in the which was recorded the language of, in the language of Adam, for it was given unto as many as were called upon by God to write by the spirit of revelation. And then he says, for a book of remembrance we have written among us according to the pattern given by the finger of God. And it is even in our own language. And we think of the Ten Commandments and Moses standing up on the mount and the Lord saying, Thou shalt not kill, you know, and you see, but that happened earlier. So the first record that they had was written by the finger of the Lord. And so we see that there's this pattern. And God provides these scriptures. He writes them with his own finger, and then he calls someone with authority. And so that they can continue his word. And so this record has a dual purpose. It's to proclaim the purposes, excuse me, proclaim the purposes of God in gathering, gathering his children, but it's also to record the names of those who enter into that covenant and accept him, and it records those who reject him so that they can be judged at the last day. And this is the record of the covenant and those who are bound to the covenant. And if you read in section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith says in verses 8 and 9 that... Whatsoever is bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he says, in other words, whatever you write on earth, he says, taking a different view of the translation, whatever you record on earth shall be recorded in heaven, and whatsoever you do not record on earth shall not be recorded in heaven. For out of the books shall your dead be judged according to their own works, whether they themselves have attended to the ordinances or their own propia persona by means of their own agents according to the ordinances which God has prepared, etc. And then he says, now it may seem to some to be a very bold doctrine that we talk of, a power which records or binds on earth and binds in heaven. Nevertheless, in all ages of the world, whenever the Lord has given a dispensation of the priesthood to any man by actual revelation or any set of man, that power has always been given. Hence, whatsoever those men did in the authority of the name of the Lord, and it truly did it truly and faithfully and kept a proper record of the same, it became a law on earth and in heaven, and it could not be annulled according to the degrees, decrees of the great Jehovah. This is a faithful saying. Now, who can understand it? And so you have this great doctrine of the priesthood, and it's the doctrine of the record. And this is really important to understand. If you have the priesthood, you have a modern record because it's the whole purpose of God gathering his children. And if you don't have a record, you don't have the priesthood. And so that priest is going to give you cont continuing covenants. It's going to give you an authorized representative. And it's going to bind on earth or loose on earth and in heaven. And it's going to list who has that inheritance. And so one of the things that God does is he says, now look, if you don't have a book, you don't have the priesthood. So this is really important. If you reject the gospel, you lose the right to keep the book. Now, that's the doctrine. Think of the application of that doctrine. Let's look at the Book of Mormon in two instances. Laban doesn't have the right to keep the record because he's wicked. 
And so we transfer from Laban to Nephi, who is called now to keep the record so that his people can prosper and then they can have the covenants of the Lord and their names can be written in the book. When Nephi leaves Laman and Lemuel, what happens to Laman and Lemuel? They're angry because they understand the doctrine of the record. They don't have the record. They don't have the priesthood. They don't have the ability then to um, be God's spokesperson and to, and to lead the people. Now, this happens to be an image of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sadly, I can't find one of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But these we think of as the great patriarchs. If you go to Utah, to Zion's um, Canyon, they have the three spires, and they say, well, that's, those are the three patriarchs. God is a God of nor a order. And so when he gives this record, it's just not, it doesn't go out willy-nilly. He says, I have to have one person responsible for this record, and it's a huge responsibility. It started out with Adam, and then Adam gave it to his son, and so this is a patriarchal order that we have. And so we go down through the patriarchs to receive that record. And it's interesting because you come to a point where you have this patriarchal order with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we know about the covenants of Abraham. And you read in the Book of Mormon, for example, that we are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. And you realize if you descend from Abraham, you get certain promises, right? But there are many people on this earth, and many people are not of our covenant that descend from Abraham, and yet they have promises. Those promises become a little bit greater when you go through Isaac, because you know Isaac had a brother, and he didn't get those same promises. Those promises then become greater when you go through Jacob. Jacob also had a brother, and his brother gets some promises, but they're not as great as Jacob's. So it's important to know what your genealogy is, so you can look back at your ancestors. But the greatest of all is Joseph. And Joseph is the one who, through whom the uh, priesthood and the gathering of Israel will happen in the last days. And so it's important to know who your fathers are because there's going to be some promises and there's going to be some prophecies that happen about that. And just um, to say this is really an important doctrine, it's the fathers who say who's in and who's out, who gets into the record. And so if you read in DNC section 85 verse 9, it says, and all they who are not found written in the book of remembrance shall have not, find none inheritance in that day, but they shall be cut asunder, and their portion shall be appointed among the unbelievers where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so you also see that God understands this principle from the very beginning. He knows that there's going to be an apostasy a few times. And so we know about these great, what we would call prophet restorers. And the first one that we read about is Abraham. And Abraham gets a record. He restores this book of the creation, which we would call an account of Genesis. But you also see the same thing um, with Joseph, Moses, Christ, and then Joseph Smith. Actually, the prophecies about these restore prophets is the greatest and most repeated prophecy in, this, in scriptures. We have Genesis chapter 50. This is the first, and you have Joseph, who is the greatest seer. And he says, the Lord has shown me Shiloh, and he tells us all about Jesus Christ. And then he says, but there will also be a Moses. And Moses, I am sure of, and he will redeem Israel from Egypt. But then there will, become, there will be another one after Shiloh, and his name will be my name, and his father's name will be my name as well. And he talks about Joseph Smith. And it's a really uh, beautiful um, section. And um, it's this prophecy of Joseph then gets repeated. So Moses in Deuteronomy 18, he says, another prophet like unto me will the Lord your God raise up and him also shall ye hear. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is there's kind of come a day when, the, when Christ is going to come on the earth and he's going to be like me, meaning he's going to gather his people, he's going to restore gospel, he's going to give you new covenants, and if you think 
that you can say, we have Moses to our father and we're going to reject you and your covenants, then you will be cut off from among the people. So he explicitly uh, uh, says that. When Christ comes, he says to the Nephites, I am he of whom Moses spake. And he repeats that. But the interesting thing he says, now if you look forward, I will cause my words to come forth in this book. And the person who brings them forth, you will hear and he will be like me. And those people who do not hear the words of that book will be cut off from among my people. And so Joseph sees all of this. And that's why Joseph says, therefore, the fruit of my loins shall write, and the fruit of the loins of Judah shall write. And we'll put in this history and the covenants that the Lord is gonna make with our people. Because by the words of the book, we are going to be gathered into the covenant, or we're going to be um, rejected and cut off. Okay, so um, I, I just want to do a quick aside and talk to you about how great these prophet restorers are so that you can kind of get a context of how great Joseph is. There's a really great account where in Numbers chapter 11, Miriam and Aaron... She says to Aaron, you know what? Joseph married uh, an Ethiopian wife. And I wouldn't have done that. And aren't we as good as Moses? We have the spirit of prophecy. And so they start talking behind Moses' back. And the scripture says, and the Lord heard it. (laughs) And so he says, and so the Lord called Miriam and Aaron out of the congregation to come to the front by the tabernacle, to the door of the tabernacle. And this is what the Lord says to Miriam. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Miriam, unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, come out ye three into the tabernacle of the congregation. And they came out and the Lord came down on a pillar of the cloud and he stood in the door of the tabernacle and he called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forth and he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid? to speak against my servant Moses. And immediately, Miriam had leprosy. And so it takes her seven days of purification so that she uh, can have that curse taken away from her. Um, Now you jump to Doctrine and Covenants section 28, verse 2. And the Lord says, Joseph is my appointed spokesperson. He's the leader of the church, for he receiveth my commandments even as Moses. So there are prophets, and then there are prophets. And Moses was a great prophet. Joseph of Egypt was a great prophet. And Joseph Smith stands in that inner circle of the great prophet restorers to whom the Lord speaks, apparently, even face to face. All right, so now we come to Moroni. We're going to set this scene. And so we want to talk a little bit about Moroni. And so we have this prophecy that tells us that Moroni is going to come. And you've read this. It's in Malachi. And he says, behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And this is the um, announcement at the end of the Old Testament that the day of restitution will finally come at some point. And when it does, there's going to be an Elias or a messenger who is going to prepare the way. And one of the things he's going to do is going to turn the hearts of the children to the promises that were made to their fathers. And it's going to happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord. All right, so I just want to do a quick interlude here and talk a little bit about Moroni, this great man who comes to Joseph Smith some of the things we know about him. Now, he was a warrior, and he was a prophet. 
He lived alone for about 36 or 37 years after his father was killed in battle. He saw the Savior and talked with him. He said that the Savior talked with me in pure humility as a man speaks to another face to face. Here's another man that sees the Savior in that way. He's the last, last witness of the destruction of the Nephites, and he was resurrected. Now think about that. He dies 1,400 years before Joseph Smith. He dies 400 and something years after Christ, and yet he's resurrected. So we learn a little bit about a dispensation of resurrection, and it just reminds me of um, Enoch's day. Enoch had the key of translation, right? And so he was able to translate his people. But we also learn that even after the flood, people are getting translated. And Abraham, Paul tells us, is looking for that heavenly city. He wants to get translated. And he goes and he sees Mal um, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek says, eh, you got to have to stay. <laughs> you know, you're going you're to start all over again. And, and you're going to have your own posterity. But so we see that translation was happening quite a bit after um, Enoch is, has gone. And I think that this is what happens with Moroni. He appears to at least 17 people that we know of, and he shows them the golden plates. He was, interestingly, and I got to tell you, this is really a fascinating story to me. Joseph Smith Sr., he has a series of seven remarkable dreams. He knows they're different. He knows they come from Heavenly Father. That's why he tells Lucy to write them down. Brethren, if you want anything done, Get your wives to write it down. That, that way you know what's going to happen. And so we have some of those dreams recorded by Lucy. In all of those dreams, one of them is he's in a, a barren uh, area, like a desert, and he's walking through this wilderness, and he meets a guide, and the guide tells him, I'm the messenger. And he says, you're going to go to this clearing, and you're going to see this box, a wooden box on top of a log. And when you open that box, you will find a great treasure of wisdom. So Joseph is walking along this trail. He comes to this clearing in this woods. He sees the log. He goes and he picks up this box. And he says, it was about the size that he could put under his arm like this. He opens the lid and immediately when he does, hoofed creased beasts of the forest of every kind all of a sudden appear and they're pawing at the ground and they're roaring at him and he realizes I have to flee for my life and he said, but I was never happier than at that moment when I opened the box. He didn't get to see what was inside the box. He has another dream. He's walking in a dreary wilderness and a messenger comes to him, his guide, and he says, you're going to go find a tree. And we see this very similar dream that Joseph Smith Sr. has to the dream that Lehi has. Now, the reason why that's so peculiar and interesting is because Moroni comes to Joseph Smith and he says, he, he quotes Malachi and he says, behold, I will send you um, uh, Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Um, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers, lest the earth be utterly wasted at his coming. And he says to Joseph, I'm the messenger. And then he comes back three more times. And one of those times was because Joseph is out in the field and he's so dead from the night before that his dad says, you got to go home. You're no use to us now. You're going to hurt yourself. And so he's going back. He falls over the fence Moroni wakes him up and he says, you got to go back and tell your dad. And I think that Moroni senses that Joseph thinks, my dad is not going to understand this. He's not going to believe me. And what does Moroni say? Tell him the messenger sent you. And Joseph goes back and he says, dad, you're not going to believe this. But last night I had this vision and this angel came told me he was the messenger, and this is what he said. And Joseph Sr. weeps, and he says, go do everything that he told you, it is true. This is the fulfillment of the father's dreams. And Moroni says to Joseph Smith, quoting Joel chapter two, that your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see, have visions. And that was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Okay, 
So we know that uh, Moroni translates the book of Ether. If you read in section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants, you realize the Lord committed to Moroni the stick, the keys of the stick of Ephraim. And I want to just talk about that briefly. But um, he appears to Joseph Smith at least 22 times that we know. He appears to the three witnesses. Here's an interesting account with Moroni. I don't know if you know this story. W.W. W. Phelps is out in the fields. He gets separated from his friends. He's up in, in New York, upstate New York, somewhere maybe around here. And so he's with his horse, and he dismounts from his horse. He's famished. He's hungry. A little ways away, John P. Green and his wife Rhoda are about to sit down to dinner, and a man knocks on the door. He's an older man in traveling clothes, and he says, good evening. I have a friend who needs a loaf of bread. Can you give me one? And they said, gladly. And they take this linen cloth and they pin it together with six pins. W.W. Phelps is wandering in this field, wondering what he should do. He comes upon this rock. It's got a loaf of bread with six pins. Moroni appears to W.W. Phelps. And then he's so gracious, he takes the linen cloth and the six pins back to John P. Green into Rhoda. That's an incredible story. He appears to Emma Smith. He appears to Mary Whitmer. We've heard that story of appearing to Mary Whitmer. How about Zara Pulsifer? Do you know the story of Zara Pulsifer? Zara is a preacher, and he has a large congregation. He goes into his barn, and all of a sudden, this spotlight comes down on him. So he looks up, and he sees Moroni. And Moroni shows him the plates. He talks to him about how the gospel is going to be restored. Zara happens to have this congregation in a place called Colesville. Have you heard of that before? Zara joins a church. Most of his congregation joins the church. He becomes a 70, um, later a missionary. And one of the most remarkable accounts, he goes and preaches the gospel to Wilford Woodruff. And Wilford joins the church indirectly because of what Moroni did. Um, John Taylor. John Taylor, before he joins the church, he has this dream. He sees this angel, and he is trumpeting, and he has the restored gospel. And he doesn't know what this is. He gets a Book of Mormon. He goes, oh, I know what this is all about. I had this dream. I saw Moroni. Um, one of the most remarkable things is a statement by Orson Hyde. Orson Hyde said that Moroni is the angel guardian of America. He was with Washington in his camps of trouble. He presides over the destiny of the United States. He was with Columbus. He gave him dreams. He calmed the elements and helped his frail vessel reach America. Now, think of the keys of the stick of Ephraim that God committed to Moroni, and the keys of the stick of Ephraim are this. It's not just so that you can translate the stick of Ephraim, but it's so that the stick of Ephraim can sweep the earth as a flood, that that righteousness can go out. In order for that to happen, our American government has to be in place. Freedom has to be here. And he has to make sure that certain people are involved in that. Moroni has a very intimate role to play when we're talking about coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Let's get back to that prophecy from Malachi. And have you, these are the words that Malachi uh, speaks or writes, but it's very interesting because they are identical to the words that another prophet wrote, and that prophet lived a thousand years before Malachi. So the question is, who said it? Who do we give credit for this great prophecy of sending Elijah the prophet in the messenger, which will prepare the way for the Lord? And it's interesting, too, because Nephi says, for behold, thus saith the prophet. And I just want to explain that really quickly. When you have great prophet restorers, they stand head and shoulders above other prophets. And so in the Old Testament days, Isaiah says, for thus saith the prophet, and we know what Isaiah was referring to, it's 
Moses, because Moses is the great prophet restorer. He gives us Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and he sets the law. But Nephi is from the stick of Ephraim. Nephi is a descendant of Joseph. And so I submit to you that when Nephi is talking about, thus saith the prophet, he's really speaking about the prophet Joseph. And I'll explain why I think that's the case. But here we go back to Joseph. Nephi says, of Joseph, there are, um, he is, he is a, the greatest prophet, and of his prophecies, there are few greater. And then he um, says, for behold, he truly testified concerning all of his seed to the end of time. And here's an interesting thing about Joseph. Joseph is 17 years old, and he comes down to breakfast, and he says, I had the craziest dream, and you need to hear it. We harvested in the field, and I got my sheaves together and tied them together, and you all, my brothers, my 11 brothers, tied your sheaves together, and then guess what? They all bowed down to me. Well, they didn't really care to hear that story, right? It really kind of bothered them that their sheaves would bow down to him. And when we're talking about those sheaves, we're really talking about something that's temporal, so the next day he comes down to breakfast and he says, oh, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And then Jacob says to Joseph, what are you telling me that even your mother and I will be under you throughout the eternities? So now we see that there's an eternal aspect to this dream that Joseph has. And so that there are greater ramifications. So the real question I have is, what does Joseph's dream have to do with Malachi and Nephi's prophecy? We're talking about sheaves, and this is where Moroni comes in. What's left after the harvest? When you see the harvest, and you've got all the sheaves, and you've gathered them together, what's left in the field? It's the stubble. Now, don't you think that 17-year-old Joseph of Egypt saw the stubble? Don't you think that he understood what that stubble meant? Don't you think that he probably also prophesied before the great and dreadful day of the Lord that's going to be burned and all the proud and they that do wickedly, etc.? I think it's interesting that Joseph of Egypt has a dream at age 17. Joseph Smith is visited by Moroni, at age 17. And here's the interesting thing. Moroni comes on September 21st, 1823. This is the hour of Yom Kippur. This is the Feast of the Tabernacles. This is when the harvest has been gathered in and the fields are burned. So this is the significance of Moroni coming to Joseph Smith. And when we talk about the messenger who turns the hearts of the children to their fathers, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and most importantly, Joseph. And so what is our obligation once we understand and when we know this? How do we honor Joseph? How do we honor Moroni? And the first thing that I would say is, get your name in the book. <laughs> Get in the record. Live a life that where you keep your covenants and you make the covenants with God so that you can be counted and judged at the last day and be able to fall on the necks of the other saints in Zion. Um, I think that that's the most important thing. We need to teach this to our posterity. And we need to serve. We need to bear testimony to the truthfulness of Joseph Smith. Now look behind me. What do you see? It's a baptismal font, right? Everybody can recognize that's a baptismal font. If I were to ask you, what do the 12 oxen represent? And what would your answer be? Well, they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And my answer to you would be, no, they do not. If we were to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, we'd have to have a doe in there to represent Naphtali, and we'd have to have a wolf in there to represent 
Dan, and we'd have to have a lion in there to represent Judah. What's going on here? Who's the ox? It's Ephraim. And it's Ephraim that goes out and gathers Israel back and fulfills the promise made to the fathers of bringing his children back to the covenant so that they can be saved, so they can come back into the family of Israel. I bear testimony to you of the great truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, of the significance of Moroni's visit to Joseph Smith that started the earth being swept with righteousness as a flood. And I plead with you, with us all and myself included, that we would do everything in our power to help to bring that to pass and to honor our ancestors in doing so, who have honored us and Moroni. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our Heavenly Father, as a family, 
And as friends, we come together this evening and we thank thee for this opportunity we've had to meet together and to reflect on the glorious bursting forth of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are grateful, Father, for Moroni's visit to the prophet Joseph. We are grateful for the, the beauties of the gospel message that are fully available to us to help us to better understand thy will and what we can do. We pray as we go forward from this meeting that we might reflect on our ancestors and what they paid to know thee. And we pray for the courage that we too might be willing to pay the necessary price, that we might be with them again. We pray for thy spirit as we go forth from this session, and we do so in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>